Good morning, everyone. This is Paul Watslavic, Director of the East Asia Pacific Media Hub here in Tokyo. Thank you for being with us today. We have a very special guest today on our teleconference, Admiral Samuel Locklear, Commander of U.S. Pacific Command. I'd like to introduce the format and then have Admiral Locklear make his opening remarks. Today we have journalists from around the region participating in the call. All participants are currently muted. When you want to ask a question, please press 9-1 on your handset and you will be loaded into the queue. We will then unmute you and notify you when it's time to ask your question. We have approximately 45 minutes today for the teleconference. We'd like to keep our uh, answers, uh, our, excuse me, our questions brief to give the Admiral time to answer everyone that uh, we can get in today. So thank you very much again for your participation. And Admiral Locklear, I turn it over to you for your opening comments, sir. Well, thank you, Paul, for that uh, introduction, and thanks to all of you who have made uh, time for this call today. I'm told we have a diverse group of more than 60 people from throughout the Asia Pacific that span about 15 nations, with many of our smaller island nations joining a call like this for the first time. Uh, it's humbling uh, to see your interest in what we're doing here at PACOM, and I hope you'll find today's discussion uh, informative. And a special thanks to the folks at East Asia and Pacific Media Hub for arranging this unique opportunity. Before taking your questions, I'd like to share my thoughts on the Asia Pacific, where I see opportunities for cooperation or where potential challenges exist. I've been in command of the U.S. Pacific Command for almost a year now. And during that time, I've grown in my appreciation of the diverse complexity that exists. As you may know, the Asia Pacific encompasses over half the Earth's surface and well more than half of its population. It's incredibly socially, culturally, economically, and geopolitically diverse. The many nations who associate themselves here include two of the three largest economies in the world, seven of the ten smallest, the most populous nation in the world, the world's largest democracy, the world's largest Muslim-majority nation, the smallest republic in the world, nine of the ten world's largest ports, and the busiest sea lanes in the world with over $8 trillion of two-way trade with half the world's container cargo and 70% of shipboard energy passing through the Asia-Pacific every day. It is also the most militarized area in the world seven of the world's ten largest standing militaries. The world's largest and most sophisticated navies are in the Asia Pacific. And five of the world's declared nuclear nations are here. All of these aspects of the Asia Pacific, when you take them and sum them all together, result in a unique strategic complexity. And of course this complexity is magnified by a wide, diverse group of challenges. Challenges that can significantly stress the security environment. Let me just name a few of them. First, climate change. Climate change is impacting our weather. It's impacting uh, sea levels. It's impacting the future security of many nations in the region, and we must understand it and must understand how to deal with it when the time comes. Transnational, non-state threats, such as violent extremist organizations, terrorist organizations, drug flow, human capital, uh, those, uh, those type of things continue to, to will con continue and will continue to probably give us problems. There are historic and emerging border and territorial disputes. Access and freedom of action in the shared domains of sea, space, and cyber are becoming increasingly challenged. It looks like instability on the Korean Peninsula will persist. And of course, how the rise of China and India as global economic powers and regional military powers emerge, and how they integrate into an established, generally peaceful and stable security environment uh, will be, is yet to be seen. And adding to this picture a recognition that no single governance mechanism exists in the Asia Pacific to manage the relationships and provide a framework for conflict resolution. That's why I think the U.S. rebalance strategy is important to the Asia Pacific. It is the foundation for the many opportunities for cooperation the United States have with our allies, partners, and friends in the Asia Pacific. Our strategy draws on the strengths of the entire U.S. government, including policy, diplomacy,
trade, and of course security, which is the area that I work in. But I want to stress that this is a whole of government, a whole of people approach to the Asia Pacific. It's not just about the military piece of this, which we seem to focus on. Now, there's been significant speculation and skepticism about the U.S. rebalance. Let me just say this. The rebalance is a strategy of collaboration and cooperation. And the keystone of our rebalance will be to use that strategy of collaboration to modernize and strengthen our five Pacific Treaty alliances, and this work is moving ahead in earnest. From the military commander's perspective, I can tell you that our alliances, you know the United States only has seven treaty allies in the world, five are in the Asia Pacific, and that these alliances bring with them years of mutual trust and respect, significant interoperability and information sharing, a common view of regional security landscapes and challenges, and they provide a very good base from which multilateral relationships can grow, like what we're seeing today, all of which will continue to underpin U.S. security objectives in the Asia-Pacific for decades to come. And while modernizing or strengthening our bilateral relationships, we're also going to strengthen our commitment to our partners in the region and the multilateral forums such as ASEAN and the East Asia Summit. We'll pursue a lasting relationship with China, including a military-to-military -military relationship. Our two countries have a strong stake in regional peace and stability and an interest in building a cooperative bilateral relationship. We're hoping to look past those areas where we differ and to focus our relationship on our converging interests, such as counter-piracy, counter-terrorism, protecting sea lanes of communication, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief response, just to name a few. So today there's nearly 350,000 U.S. military personnel serving forward, living in the Asia Pacific, and with them nearly 70,000 family members, all of whom continue to demonstrate significant U.S. commitment to our allies and partners. Let me close my opening remarks by just saying this. America is a Pacific power. Uh, sometimes I think they, folks in Asia Pacific look to the east and they see uh, a, a partner that is a long ways away. Uh, we are a Pacific power. Uh, not only is, is, are we on the Pacific, but we also have historic ties, economic ties uh, here that uh, it's important for everyone to recognize that we have significant interest as a nation in the Asia Pacific that we think will continue for decades to come. Uh, so I look forward to cooperating and working together with all of our friends, our allies, our partners in building a security environment that for this amazing region will provide hope, peace, and security for our children and our grandchildren. So I'll pause there now and answer your questions. Admiral, thank you very much for those opening remarks. We're going to go now to our journalists around the region who are participating. What we're going to do is we're going to unmute you, identify you, but we'd like you also to state your name and your affiliation. So the first call, Admiral, will be from Guangzhou, China, KDNet. Caller, please identify yourself and your, ask your question. Thank you. Good morning, sir. My name is Coco Nan. I'm an employer from Kaidi, UBS. I'm happy to have this chance to ask you a question. My question is, what will the United States do if they were to establish a sustainable relationship with the developing country in order to, in order to improve their human rights? Which country? Yeah, would you uh, repeat the question? I didn't. I, I understood that. What would the United States do in which country for human rights? Uh, <clears throat> the developing country. No. Yeah. Developing. Yeah, I think. Uh, first of all, thank you for your question, and I'm glad to hear you're coming in from Guangzhou. I was recently in Guangzhou on a mill-to-mill -mill relationship uh, counterpart visit. And I was unbelievably impressed by the progress I'm seeing in Guangzhou, uh, both uh, culturally and economically. So you're to be congratulated on that. 
Uh, I believe your question is, what will the U.S. do to support uh, human rights in developing countries? Uh, I believe that the U.S. has a very good record uh, of having uh, 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 policies and perspectives and taking leadership role in uh, encouraging developing nations to first understand the responsibility uh, to their people, uh, the responsibility of how their government must respond to f people who are free, uh, and how their militaries must support that uh, uh, in, in, a, uh, in a society where uh, civilian rule is important and that uh, human rights should be the center focus of all decisions that are made. Uh, so I think the U.S. Uh, uh, role in this has been pretty uh, clear over time, and uh, my expectation is that it will continue, and it will continue to underpin our strategy as we go forward. Admiral, thank you for that. Our next caller today is from Indonesia, Viva News. Caller, would you please state your name and ask your question clearly, please? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning, Admiral. Uh, my name is Tony Kawilarang. I'm a journalist of FIFANIS.com. I'm calling you from Jakarta, Indonesia. My question is, um, under the co comprehensive policy signed by President Obama and President Yudhoyo in November 2010, Indonesia and the United States are trying to expand and strengthen bilateral security partnerships, including maritime security cooperation. How has this cooperation progressed over the years? And as a specific military commander, what programs do you expect to be happening this year between TECOM and TNI? Thank you. Well, thank you for that, uh, that uh, great question. Um, it's true our uh, presidents have signed a, uh, an agreement with each other uh, that gives us specific directions on how we as military and government officials must uh, progress together on the great partnership that we uh, have with, uh, with the great nation of Indonesia. Uh, just as you, uh, it's fortuitous you ask this question because I will uh, leave early, later next week uh, to make uh, my uh, official visit to Jakarta to visit with the leadership, uh, mili both military and civilian leadership of Indonesia. And I very much look forward to the three or four days that I will be uh, hosted in your country. And at that time, we will take the opportunity to ensure that the, the roadmap that we are on together uh, from a mill to mill perspective uh, between the U.S. and Indonesia and uh, the leadership role that Indonesia will plays and will continue to play in, uh, in your part of the world, uh, as well as uh, the various uh, multilateral organizations and multilateral operations that may be going on. So we will focus on, uh, continue to focus on those things that, number one, are important uh, to uh, Indonesia. I think uh, maritime security is very important. It's important to both of us. You live in the crossroads of really the most, one of the most important um, logistics uh, sites in the world. And uh, your leadership in that area and our support of your leadership in that area uh, will be key as we move forward. So we have a lot of good things planned, a lot of good uh, exercises together, uh, as well as uh, growing uh, multilateral exercises as well. Admiral, thank you for that. Our next caller is from Taiwan. TVBS. Caller, if you'd please state your name and your question. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Sarah Sun and I'm from TVBS. I have a question. China and Japan are escalating on Daoyu Island. If military actions are enforced, will U.S. step in? And also, do you support President Ma's Easy China Peace Initiative? Thank you. Well, a great question. Let me start by the, with the second question first. Uh, it's not really my position to, to, to support or not support uh, what President Ma and the people of Taiwan choose to do. So uh, I will uh, defer that question to the, the people of Taiwan. Uh, your first question, though, is a good one. I think it's, uh, first of all, I'm not going to speculate on, on what the U.S. would do militarily in any contingency anywhere in the world. It's just not our policy to do that. Uh, I would say, though, that uh, in the scenario that you talked about in, in the, the, uh, uh, the East China Sea between uh, PRC, between China and Japan, 
Uh, let me make sure everybody's clear. First, the U.S. does not uh, take sides in territorial disputes anywhere in the world, uh, except on the ones that we may have of, of our own. Uh, but we don't take sides on those. Uh, but what we do expect, as we expect in, in, in any region, is that these disputes will be uh, done in a fashion that uh, uh, is peaceful, uh, without coercion, and that it ultimately will be uh, uh, satisfied and decided between the governments and without uh, military intervention. So that's our hope. Uh, you know, what's at stake here in the Asia Pacific from a security perspective, from an economic, from a uh, human capital perspective, uh, to, uh, to co even contemplate that there would be use of force uh, in these type of issues, I think, is, is really uh, unacceptable. Uh, we need to be thinking and having our dialogue talk about how we are going to work together to produce a security environment uh, that allows us to get through these uh, disagreements we have with each other, because uh, they will continue. Uh, this, this is just the nature of uh, humanity. Admiral, thank you for that. Our next question is from Fiji. The Fiji Sun caller, if you please uh, state your name and your question, please. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Um, our country is about to go into elections, and there are reforms in place, and also the drafting of our constitution. Uh, any plans from um, uh, from your country uh, to help us uh, in this move? Well, uh, good to hear you from Fiji. You live in one of the most beautiful parts of the world, uh, so uh, I'm, we're envious of you. Uh, I believe that your question was that you are uh, moving towards your elections here, uh, expected in, I think, in 2014. Uh, and uh, I would say that the PACOM perspective, and I believe the U.S. perspective, is that we are we are encouraged, we encourage and we are encouraged by Fiji's progress towards free and fair democratic elections. Uh, and uh, we look forward to re-engaging in Fiji uh, there soon. Uh, and we wish you well. This can be difficult sometimes, we understand. And I'm sure that uh, uh, I, all Americans join me in hoping that uh, your elections uh, serve the people of Fiji well. Admiral, thank you. Our next question is from Malaysia, Berita Harian. Uh, caller, please state your name and your question for the Admiral, please. Thank you. Good morning, Admiral. Uh, my name is Nur Hazrin from Bristahari, and I'm from Kuala Lumpur. Again, this is uh, regarding the uh, East and Southeast Asia dispute. What is your approach uh, on to ease the tension, and whether is it uh, are you going to push for... Um, Treaty, or is it uh, basically on humanitarian assistance? Can you explain? Yeah, I uh, I think that uh, I understood the question. You're talking about the current tensions that are in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, and what are our intentions? Uh, uh, well, I think our first intention is to ensure that uh, we main, uh, maintain a good dialogue between our allies and our partners, uh, including uh, with China and, and the, the, all the countries that are affected by this type of uh, uh, concern in, 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 their, in the maritime domain, uh, that we uh, do good information sharing so we have, uh, all have a sense of what's going on, uh, that we continue to encourage that the disputes and the, uh, the activities that each country undertakes be done with uh, law enforcement, maritime, fishery patrol, uh, those types of things, and not to introduce, uh, uh, and, and not to introduce uh, military uh, hardware aspects into it that might lead to miscalculation. So we're trying to do all we can uh, to manage the environment to help the security environment, so that we don't have a miscalculation that then uh, causes this to go in a direction we don't want it to go. Now. Uh, we're also very much interested in the multilateral cooperation of the countries in the region, uh, their leadership in this. Uh, a code of conduct would go a long ways. 
uh, in helping the you know, nations in the region deal with their differences as the governments work out the long-term solutions. So we're very much in favor of a code of conduct, uh, and uh, we would be certainly willing to assist in, in, and facilitate that as possible. Now, in the area of uh, human uh, assistance and disaster relief that you mentioned, uh, you know, this, go, this problem uh, it goes well beyond any uh, territorial dispute that we'll be talking about. We're talking about bringing together nations, the powers of nations, including their military power, to be able to quickly and effectively assist where we can in the response to the response of large natural disasters. Whether it's a tsunami in Indonesia, uh, an earthquake in Japan, a uh, storm in the United States, a uh, pick, pick something, anywhere in this region, uh, we want to ensure that we have the right level of cooperation that we thought through the processes of how we can bring uh, assistance quickly as military. Because in crisis, particularly humanitarian crisis, the militaries can bring things quickly to restore um, hope, uh, to bring uh, order to the problem so that we can, so that the other government agencies can then respond and to get ahead and, and to, get, uh, to get control of the crisis. So uh, this, this idea of Learning how to cooperate for, for human assistance and disaster relief is a great idea, and it's the right idea, and it's the future of the security environment here in the Asia Pacific. I'm convinced. Admiral, thank you. Our next question is from Australia, the Australian uh, caller. Please identify yourself and state your question. Thank you. Hello, my name is Admiral. Thanks very much. My name is Brendan Nicholson. Uh, I'm defence editor of the Australian newspaper. Um, I'm based in Canberra. The, um, look, there's been much talk of uh, the US pivot um, rebalancing, or whatever the terminology is currently. The, uh, clearly, Australia has a very intense interest in this. There, the, the, the marine training component. Um, and in, in, across the, the north of Australia is going to increase uh, over time to something like 2,500 personnel. Uh, now, we're very interested to know just how the United States military in particular sees this relationship developing. You know, how important is Australia to the, to, to the hands-on military people, such as yourself, uh, um, and what's, what could we expect to see in in the years to come? There's been talk of uh, increased aircraft visits, increased ship visits, and uh, some of your think tanks, for instance, have talked about the possibility of um, the uh, of cooperation in terms of a possible submarine base on the west coast of Australia. Just logistically, how would that how would that work, and and how feasible is it, and how important is Australia militarily to the United States? Well, Brendan, that was a, a, a lot of questions in there, but let me see if I can uh, frame, frame it for you uh, in, a, in a way that the, the entire audience can see our perspective. Um, the term we use is interchangeable between rebalance and pivot, I think, depending on who you talk to, but for me, it's a rebalance. Uh, if, if you take a uh, – I, I challenge everyone to do this, to, to take uh, the world map – and to uh, sit in your own country, make that the center of the world map, and then to look at it from the, that perspective. So when, as a, me as a PACOM commander, I go down to Canberra and I sit and I look at the world map from uh, Australia being the center of it, I get a very different view than I get when I look at it from Hawaii or from Washington, D.C. And I start to have a sense of the things and the security environment that concern the people of Australia as well as people of Indonesia and India and, and other countries, and I start to see, uh, first, the growing importance of the Indian, Indian Ocean, uh, and we're really going to go well beyond eventually talking about the, only about the Asia-Pacific. It's really about the Indo-Asia-Pacific uh, because of how connected the world is and how important these large bodies of water are and the countries around them are to the security and the prosperity of, of the of, of future generations. 
So when we look at our relationship with Australia, number one, a very uh, good, close ally, historically has been uh, alongside the U.S. Uh, in, on many, uh, in many uh, uh, times in the past, and, and I think we'll hopefully will be, continue in the future. Um, and as we look at the security challenges, whether it's, it's climate change or HADR, Human Assistance Disaster Relief, or whether it's uh, maritime security, or whether it's cyber security, or whether it's space security, uh, all those things, uh, I view uh, from the PACOM headquarters here that uh, Australia is a, is a critical pillar of uh, the, the strategy we have here in this theater, and we will continue to operate closely. Now, uh, you know, where we're going to uh, have ship visits and those type of things, I think is not really relevant to the discussion here. Uh, what really is relevant is, first of all, for the whole audience, is that the rebalance the U.S. rebalance is not about establishing U.S. bases anywhere else in this theater. It is not our objective. Our objective is to build on the relationships that we have created uh, in a peaceful, relatively peaceful Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific for the last 60 years, and to continue to build on those, uh, to continue to posture ourselves with our allies, with our partners, and with our emerging partners, and be able to work together to build a security environment that protects the interests of everyone. And that's including bringing a rising China into the secure environment in a way where they uh, feel that their interests are, are protected as well as uh, that the people around them are comfortable within that, in that environment. So, um, and the same could be said about uh, India's emerging role. So uh, Australia, uh, you know, answer the question just go there, look at the map, put all straight, and you'll see why it's important to me. Thanks, brother. Admiral, thank you. I uh, apologize for the uh, the beeps on the line. We had a few people uh, that dropped off. We put them back on. Okay. Okay. Uh, sir, we are about uh, two-thirds of the way through our call. We still have a lot of people on the line, so we're going to keep moving along. We're going back to China now. Uh, the 21st Century Business Herald out of Shanghai has a call on the line. Caller, if you'd please identify yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lin. I'm from 21st Century Business Herald, and thank you for your speech. I'd like to ask one question. In 2005, Solik proposed that China should be a responsible stakeholder. But five years later, Hillary suggested to rebalance the China. So in your opinion, what's the difference between these two? expressions, and uh, what factors make the U.S. make such a great change? Thank you. Well, I'm, uh, let, let me just, I won't comment on what Secretary uh, Clinton uh, said specifically, because I don't have it in, in front of me, but uh, I think your, your question is, 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 what are the things that, that uh, as, as, as China uh, grows as a regional uh, and a world economic power and a regional security partner. Uh, you know, from my perspective as PACOM, what can they do, what can China do better to, to or what can we do to, what can we do better, all of us do better, to work together to uh, allow China to assume the position that they need to assume. Uh, first, I think uh, we should make sure that we have a robust dialogue, uh, both uh, economically, politically, and militarily. So we're working hard at the military to military piece of it because it's important that the U.S. military presence in the Asia Pacific and the Chinese military PLA presence that we don't have miscalculations, that we understand each other. And we're working to do that. We have uh, good dialogues. We have uh, good cross visits with each other. Uh, we have invited the Chinese Navy to come to Hawaii for Remember the Pacific exercise in 2014 is the world's largest exercise. It has 22 nations. And this would be, these types of things are great opportunities for us to get to know each other and to build trust and cooperation uh, and, uh, and to understand how we operate together. So from the military side, I think that using those opportunities to build, to build trust. Um, I think also that, uh, that that China has an opportunity here as they emerge uh, to be a real world leader, uh, to be a real regional leader. Uh, 
I think they have the opportunity uh, as they look at their core interests and core values and that they uh, look at how to secure those, just like all countries do, is that they uh, recognize their leadership role and that they find peaceful mechanisms to be able to help their neighbors and to help the rest of the world work through these. And I sense that that's happening. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, given uh, beyond the, the immediate uh, uh, friction areas in the world or in the Asia Pacific today, uh, I'm confident that, uh, that we're going to be able to, if we continue to work together, be able to uh, bring, uh, assimilate China into the security environment in a way that's good for China and it's good for the rest of the region, as well as good for the uh, United States, so that we all have room to prosper here. Uh, again, I go back to it. Uh, you know, the, the world belongs to everyone, and we all have now because we're globalized. All of us have interests around the world, and we have to figure out how to to live in that world together in, in a productive, safe, prosperous way. Admiral, thank you. We uh, have Korea on the line, the YTN network. Caller, if you could please identify yourself, state your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kim tae I am a reporter for YTN. It's a cable TV news channel uh, in Seoul, Korea. Uh, my question is about North Korea nuclear issue. Uh, a couple of points. Uh, first, uh, can I get your current assessment on the possible North Korean nuclear test? Is it imminent? Have you found out any movement around there in North Korea? And the second point is the general assessment on North Korean nuclear capability in terms of the size and the weight of the weapon. Do you think their weapons are small and light enough to put them on a long-range rocket? And lastly, uh, what uh, can be the possible military response if they conduct the nuclear test? Thank you very much. Well, thank you for those questions. I'm going to have to say on, on most of them that, uh, you know, it's not our, our policy nor I think the policy of the, of the uh, South Korean military to talk about uh, military contingencies that we would may or may not plan for, uh, for events. But let me talk about the uh, North Korea and, the, uh, and their, their test. Um, certainly the statements that North Korea uh, is making would lead you to believe that they uh, are desirous of another test. And these statements uh, are provocative, and I believe uh, all, we all agree that a test would be a significant violation of the UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, these type of provocations uh, that we have seen in the past would only increase Pyongyang's isolation and, and its continued focus on its nuclear program and missile program uh, is really not doing anything to help the North Korean people, which I understand need help. Uh, so we'll remain in close consultation, remain in close consultation with our uh, um, South Korea and, and our other allies, and continue to monitor the, the threat of a nuclear test from North Korea, and as well as any possible threats to the U.S. or to our allies. Now, uh, the U.S. closely monitors uh, all threats to the international security environment. And, of course, we have the capability to respond uh, if and when that's appropriate. Uh, so we're not really going to talk about military options, plans, or intelligence. However, uh, we do stand ready to defend U.S. territory, our allies, and our national interests. So uh, I guess the, the message I think that I'd like to, from a PACOM perspective, is that uh, as you look at it from the, uh, from the Asia-Pacific security environment, uh, the activities in North Korea uh, have, a, have the potential to be very disruptive to the safe and secure security environment that I think all of us want. And uh, the international community, we've got to do all we can uh, to, uh, to get North Korea to, uh, to start uh, behaving within the UN Security Council resolution requirements. Admiral, thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Vietnam now. We have a caller from Toy Tray newspaper. Caller, please identify yourself and state your question clearly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Admiral, um, for your time. It's Tuan from the Chinese newspaper in Saigon. Um, I have several questions for you. First, in ASEAN, it's clearly that they torn between two competing powers, one established and one rising. 
And without clear orders, all the countries are feeling very nervous about China's every move, and they all feel threatened by China. At the same time, they feel that U.S. spy would remain in worse uh, uh, instead of real commitment. What's your take on this? The second is that uh, what will be the next direction for U.S.-Vietnam military co cooperation? Will the U.S. plan to have any other military base in Philippines or Vietnam in the near future? And the last question says that it seems that the U.S. has so many concerns right now in North Africa, in Middle East, and uh, many other places. Is it a little bit of a stretch for the U.S. to be present at so many fronts in both Asia and everywhere? Thank you, Admiral. Okay, well, let me uh, see if I can address, uh, address those. Um, you know, first, the, the first question I think you asked was about uh, the potential tension between established power, I assume you meant the United States, and the rise, the rise of a China or, or another power, and how is that, how is that going to work? Um, I think the key here that I'd like to make is that uh, as, as that occurs, and it's going to occur, uh, that we have to manage the competition between a rising power and an already established power. And that can be done. I'm convinced it can be done. Uh, but it has to be done uh, in a way where we don't, uh, when we have things that we don't agree on, that we don't lead to miscalculation, that we find the places where we, our interests converge. And in relation to the shift to the, I'll talk about the Chinese and the United States, but I think it relates to every nation in this region, is the areas where our interests converge are infinite. The areas where they diverge or which causes friction are limited. And those limited areas, we, in the world we're in today, we should be able to have mechanisms to work through that. So to the degree that ASEAN now is attempting to, to work through some of the issues around territorial disputes uh, and code of conduct, I think that it, it's incumbent upon all nations in the world to support the, the peoples of this area, including China and nations of ASEAN, to encourage them to try to get to a way they can work through their differences without creating miscalculation and disrupting the security environment. The second question about where are we with uh, our relationship with uh, Vietnam? Uh, earlier this month, we conducted a very successful defense policy dialogue in Hano Hanoi. Uh, we discussed new and innovative ways to grow our bilateral relationship, uh, search and rescue, maritime security, humanitarian disaster relief, uh, and we're very positive about our growing relationship with Vietnam, and we hope to continue increasing our bilateral ties so that, uh, again, to help secure regional peace and prosperity. Uh, now, to your question about whether there are, are there any bases planned in uh, the Philippines or in Vietnam or others, I go back to my earlier uh, comment to all of you. Uh, the U.S. has no intention of, um, of establishing more bases. Uh, what we uh, hope to do with our partners, allies, and friends is to continue to operate closely, uh, to work closely mil military to military, government to government, economy to economy, and to, uh, to ensure that uh, U.S. presence, that the people here in the region are aware of it, that they're assured by it, because, uh, I mean, if you think about the last 60 years, uh, this part of the world has been pretty safe. I mean, it's had a few places where it wouldn't, but it's been pretty safe. And I believe part of that security was underpinned by a United States who was interested in the Pacific. And I think that the United States is interested in the coming century in the Pacific and in the Indian Ocean will be a good thing for overall security. Now, the question of your, are we overstretched? Um, I think uh, certainly, um, you know, after the, the, uh, the, the uh, when the Berlin Wall came down, uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the aftermath of that, and then a follow on a few years later by 9-11, and the U.S. Leader, role the U.S. leadership took in, the, in what we call the, would call the global war on terrorism, uh, that, and that, that pulled us very heavily into some uh, very uh, costly uh, operations, uh, you know, good operations, well-intentioned operations, well-needed, but costly. 
that it has, uh, in somewhat, directed our focus uh, to the Middle East. And so now after 10 years over there, after Iraq and now after Afghanistan, uh, we are taking a hard look at what those our military look like in the future, just as all nations do. We're looking hard at where are our uh, uh, interests for the future, where are our key interests, and uh, many of those questions point us to the Asia Pacific. So the whole idea of our rebalance is should be a signal to the people in this region that uh, the American people understand how important Asia Pacific is to them. So. Uh, to the question of whether we're overstretched, no matter what we look like in the future, uh, it, it, it will be imperative for the U.S., because of the strength of our interest in this region, for us to remain actively engaged here as a good partner, as a good ally, and as a good friend of all countries in this region. Admiral, thank you. We have time for one last question. I'd like to offer it to Yoimuri Shimboom, uh, one of our Japanese partners. They're on the line. Caller, if you could please state your name and ask your question of the Admiral. And then after that, Admiral, we'll give you a chance to make some concluding comments before we wrap up. Thank you. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Sorry, uh, I'm Madhuri Sismatiko, I'm the author of Yomiuri Shimbo. Also, I'm based in Japan, I'm from uh, Japanese newspaper Yomiuri Shimbo. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, my question is about uh, multilateral cooperation uh, through the uh, Indo-Pacific region. Uh, if you look through all the Indo-Pacific region, I think in East Asia part, uh, asean Center uh, organizations are the basis for the uh, multilateral co cooperation or and dialogue. But if you look at Indian, Indian Ocean or Pacific Ocean itself, I can see uh, I can I can see any organization as active as uh, those kind of uh, asean center uh, organizations. So uh, in terms of military perspective, uh, how will United States will uh, reintegrate the current existing organizations or uh, making uh, making that kind of mechanism? Thank you very much. Yeah, I, that's a great question and uh, a very insightful question. The um, if you, if you look at, remember I started off my remarks about the size of this, of this, of this area of the world uh, and the complexity of it and the differences. I mean, when you can go from, from the, uh, you know, the Straits of Hormuzza in the, in the Middle East to the coast of California and from the north to the south pole uh, with well over half the people in the world and, and certainly the largest center of gravity for economic growth. Uh, there is no simple answer, I think, to a security organization, one security organization that will work uh, because it's too diverse. So the model that sometimes people will ask me, they'll say, well, why don't you have a NATO in, in the Asia, Indo-Asia Pacific? Uh, I've served in NATO before. It's a fine organization, but I don't see a parallel here. Uh, I see rather a what I refer to as a a patchwork or a patchwork quilt, I call it, of, of security r relationships in various parts of this vast region that work together to be able to sense and understand where the security environment is and to work together to ensure that the environment is strong enough to withstand any shocks that may occur to it, whether it's a natural disaster or some other type of contingency. So we have some fairly mature, relatively mature, mature uh, relationships, as you mentioned. Uh, ASEAN is one of them. Uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, those are developing. And many of those are developing under the leadership of uh, Indian Ocean countries, uh, as well uh, as, uh, for instance, uh, India is, uh, is taking a leadership role in working to deal with some of these uh, security uh, networks, and we welcome that. We welcome that. Uh, I think that if I look at PACOM's role in this, uh, as we go into the future, the U.S. role, uh, it is not to uh, own and dictate uh, each of these uh, uh, this security relationships. It's to be a valuable partner. Uh, it's to assist with resources and assist with training and experience where we can. Uh, 
uh, and then to uh, uh, to ensure that uh, that to the best we can that all of the various regions of the security organizations are all kind of working towards the same end state. And I believe we're headed in that direction in a good way. Admiral, thank you so much for your valuable time today. And callers, participants, thank you very much for being with us. Admiral, do you have any final remarks? And if not, uh, we very much appreciate you being with us and look forward to working with you in the future. Well, Paul, I just want to, again, thank all of you for uh, and just take just you taking the time to try to understand the complexity of the security environment and to hear it from uh, from me and I'm, I'm hopefully you're out talking to the other military commanders and the other uh, the key uh, countries that are in this region and getting their perspectives. I believe we all have kind of a similar perspective about this uh, and that uh, that we ought to be working uh, towards peace and prosperity instead of just always, seeming to work on our the areas where, where we have the most friction, uh, even though I know those will con con continue. So um, I'm sitting here in Hawaii. It's, um, it's beautiful and sunny. I hope that's true of where you are. Uh, and uh, if you get a chance to uh, come to Hawaii, uh, we'll give you a good aloha. So thank you very much.